Admiral Thomas M. Dyke has retired. We now bring you the story of one of the greatest acts of heroism in the annals of our Navy. Certainly we would search a long way before we found its equal in sheer selfless patriotism. At the end of the show, I'm sure you will agree with me. What you see on the screen actually happened. This applies not only to the central and outstanding act performed, but to the minor and supporting incidents as well. The actors bear the names of the officers and men who made the patrol. We will try to do justice to their heroism and sacrifice. In the fall of 1943, the USS Sculpin had completed her refit and training period at Pearl Harbor. They were making the final preparations for a ninth war patrol. Torpedoes were being brought alongside and lowered into the torpedo rows. Some were placed directly into the torpedo tubes for delivery where they would do the most good against a Japanese hull. The Sculpin was ready. She would make this patrol under a new skipper, Lieutenant Commander Fred Conaway from Forest City, Arkansas. He was an Annapolis graduate and an experienced submariner. The captain was at headquarters getting his patrol instructions while his officers were killing time playing backgammon waiting for word on where and how they'd spend the next 60 days. The executive officer was Lieutenant N.J. Allen from Duluth, Minnesota. The engineer and diving officer was George E. Brown, Jr. from New York, a Yale man. Lieutenant Joe DeFries, an Annapolis graduate and the son of an admiral, was the gunnery and torpedo officer. Ensign Max Fiedler from San Mateo, California, had just reported aboard from the submarine school. This was his first patrol. We see old man to get back. I'd like to know whether to load that case of long-handled drawers. I'm giving two to one that where we're going, you won't want to wear any at all. Maybe. But you can always take them off. They send us into cold weather. It's awfully nice to have a pair of woolies. What about the heaters? They're all aboard. I'm sure glad they double for fans. Wherever it is, I don't want it to start too soon. Like I jump over a barrel. What'd you do with that extra machine gun ammunition, Joe? It's on my bunk right now. No place else to put it. I'm betting you'll find a place before tomorrow morning. Thanks. Well, boys, I've got the dope, and it's going to be interesting. There's nobody on board with the ship's company, is there? No, sir. Good. The Marines are going to hit some island in the Gilberts or the Carolines. The big fleet will be there, bombarding and pounding from the air. They've tossed us the job of intercepting any Japanese reinforcements that might leave their base at truck, to knock off any cripples that might try to get in there. Sounds like a big order for one sub, but I guess that's our speed. We won't be alone. The force commander is going to radio Apagon and Spearface to join us in the wolf pack when the time is right. Which island is it? They're restricting that info to the higher echelons. They said the wolf pack commander would know. Do we carry him? Yes, it'll be Captain John Cromwell. Oh, no. Oh. He bawled me out the other day for looking like a bilge rat when we were setting those main bearing clearances. Maybe I made a mistake not bringing a tie. It's going to be hard living in tight quarters like this for two months with a regulation Commodore, but I guess we can survive it. I thought he was a captain. Well, he is, but he's division commander, so he's called Commodore when you're talking to him. Well, never learned this, Navy. Why do they do that? It makes him feel big. Anybody ever tell you how to get along with a Commodore, Maxie? No. Find out what the son of a gun wants and do it. Captain, Commodore Cromwell's coming aboard. Call it, Maxie, to see who moves in with the chief petty officers. Tail. Want to help me move some 50 caliber ammo? <laughs> oh, Brad, hmm? just put me anywhere. The ship's officers will need their rest a lot more than I will. On November the 5th, 1943, the Sculpin left Pearl Harbor. He refueled at Johnston Island and then headed for a patrol area in the Gilbert Islands. Well, this is all you're going to take to sea with your tiny? Cigarettes? Old pair of shoes? 
Well, no, sir. I got my clothes on. How do you expect to get along for two or three months without sponging off your shipmates? Well, I didn't figure a hero Hito would invite us to tea, Mr. Brown. Look at these old shoes. Well, they're kind of special, sir. Nobody in this torpedo room would go to sea if I didn't have these shoes. Oh? How's that? And these are my depth chart shoes. As long as I got them on, nobody's going to hit us. Well, in a case like that, I guess you are well equipped. Hey, Mr. Brown, can you do us a favor? Sure, what do you have? You know Warren, the electrician's mate. Yep. He's a minister's son, and, and he's real good with the Bible. Well, could you give him a battle station up here? Well, I don't have to look at the charts until when we're getting close to the enemy. I just wait for you boys to get religion. We got religion all the time, Mr. Brown. Oh, sure. The minute we get back to port, the religion's tossed over one side, and you boys go ashore over the other. Everybody gets in a few scrapes every now and then. A few scrapes? Well, I've bailed you guys out so many times I know your operation by heart. You stand at one end of the bar and pick a fight, and Tiny here steps in and finishes it. People pick on me because I'm small. Sure. Ten times in one night in Panama. And in ten different bars. Warren, I'm changing your battle station to the forward torpedo room. That business about not knowing the game is commencing to look like a come on, Commodore. No, but before we get back, I'm going to show that high hat backgammon crowd of yours a couple of old AC Ducey wrinkles. Well, I think I'll go topside and get me a breath of fresh air. If you're a skipper, let me up on a bridge. Oh, and Joe, you better practice that. You're going to need it from now on. <clears throat> what a guy. He's what they call a martinet. I'll take one for a shipmate every time. I'll say. The last couple of nights when I come off at watch at four in the morning, he's been down here to talk to me. Ask me all kinds of questions about my family and, and what I'm going to do after the war. And while we're talking, he gets coffee and makes me a sandwich just like a steward. And me just a fresh caught ensign. Maybe he can't sleep. I wish I had as little to worry about as he has. It's not that. He insisted on splitting the ammo with me. Now, here's the navigator's position from his morning star sights. Mm-hmm. See now, we are about a hundred miles northeast of Truck Atoll. Well, we could get some customers almost any time in this spot. That's right, especially within the next few days. Oh, well, how's that, Commodore? Well, I, I guess I can tell you about it. You see... Oh, excuse us a moment, please. The Marines are going ashore here at Tarawa. Oh, when does that come off? The 21st. The softening of bombardment is starting this morning. It's going to be some show. Real big one. I wish I was free to tell you more about it, but I... The less I know, the better I like it. What the Japanese interrogators are doing to some of our boys, it's... Not pretty. Only safe way is to know nothing. You know, Fred, that's exactly what I was thinking when they gave me a top secret briefing. The fearsome battle of Tarawa was starting.
Japanese forces were on the move. Battlestations torpedo. Battlestations torpedo. Battlestations torpedo. <coughs> Where are they, Joe? They're directly for them, Captain. They're dead ahead. Radar says there's seven ships. Two big ones and five small ones. I got them. Nice going, Joe. Go below. Bearing is drawing to the right, Captain. Bring a right to course three zero zero. All ahead, full. Right to course, three, zero, zero, all ahead, full. Mark, bearing 281, range 11750. TDC and plot both check on enemy course, zero, zero, nine, speed, one, four. Very well, stand by to dive. <laughs> What do you got out there, Fred? One merchant ship escorted by a light cruiser and five destroyers. Mm. An escort like that, they really must want her to get where she's going. Could be reinforcements for Tarawa. Go get him, Fred. Go get him. Yeah, yeah. He's got him on. Calm down. You got nothing to worry about. Sure. Sure. Well, that's the last one. Every compartment in the ship is checking on you. <laughs> They could only see him like we can. They wouldn't be scared at all. <laughs> <laughs> this is evidently a very important convoy. It's only one merchant type ship, but she has an escort of a light cruiser and five destroyers. Where's Warren? Where's Warren? He's not here. Maneuvering room? Tell Warren to get to his battle station on the double. After torpedo room, manned and ready. One more look and we'll shoot. Down scope. Emergency, 200 feet. They zigged right at us, too close to shoot. High speed propellers passing down the starboard side. Heavy propeller noises close aboard the board. Ball negative. Someday we're going to figure out a way to muffle the sound of that air. You can hear it for miles. They passed right over us. Mm hmm. Didn't even know we were here. Let's go after them, Captain. It's getting light now. We'll have to give them enough head start so they won't see us when we surface. Then we'll pop up and run around them. Won't need the dark in here anymore, will we? No, turn on the lights. see him in the periscope. He's right on top of us.
Conaway tried all the tricks he knew to evade. But this Japanese skipper was good. He made one damaging attack after another. To reduce the noise, the air conditioning had been shut down, and the temperature in the ship was soaring. The listening watch says the destroyer started coming in again. What's that? What's that? It sure ain't mice. Here we go, boys. Hold on. Cases. Tell them we can't pump now, they'll hear us. We can't pump now, they'll hear us. I gotta pump soon, Captain. Taking a lot of speed to keep her from sinking. We're using up the battery too fast. Now, let's just take it easy, boys. We'll give this guy the slip pretty soon. Bearing 045. The listening watch says he hears a rain squall bearing 045. Good, we could use one. Right pull rudder. We found a rain squall! We found a rain squall! I knew we had the right combination. Uh, what good's that gonna do? They don't mind getting wet. The rain on the water, stupid. It makes so much noise, they can't hear it. <laughs> okay, George, let's get those bilges pumps. Start the pumps. We can't get a suction. Go back to the engine room, see what you can do. There's nothing blocking the suction line, I just checked it. Well, we gotta get some of this water out of here. Get some buckets and form a line. We'll dump it in the forward engine room. The leaks up forward all on the control, Captain. Thanks, Maxie. Nice going. We'll get along, okay. You take over the diving station. You're doing a great job yourself, Fred. Thanks. We've got to take some of the pressure off that leak in the engine room. Take her up to 100 feet. Take her up to 100 feet. She won't go above 170 feet without more speed, Captain. Feels like we're on the surface. Surface. I'll take the dive. The listening watch reports the destroyer is coming in on another run. The Dolphin was designed to operate at a maximum depth of 250 feet. At 350 feet, the gauge reached its maximum reading as she continued to go down out of control. How deep they went, they never knew. The hull should have collapsed long ago from the great pressure. But the Sculpin and her crew were tough. They weren't beaten yet. But neither was the enemy. As the submarine reached 250 feet, there was another close explosion. Steering's knocked out. Both forward and after torpedo rooms report cracks in the hull. Water's coming in around the tubes. She won't take another death charge. Our only chance is to surface and try to get a hit on him with a deck gun. If we can't make him break off the action, school's out. That's right. This way will give our crew a chance to be saved if we don't make it. Have the life jackets passed out. George, if anything happens to us up there, be sure the ship is not captured. 
You can depend on it, Captain. Thanks, George. Okay, boys, let's go. Let's give him the works, Joe. Surface! Manifold. You go forward and you ask. Come back, let me know when all hands are out of the ship and bear a hand. Everyone's out forward. All right, you men go off this hatch. Good luck. It's time to go now, Commodore. I go with you, George. Oh, I've got a scuttle ship now. You go right ahead. Sir, the, the enemy will pick us up. Exactly, and that's what I'm trying to avoid. There's too much valuable information in here. Well, that's your decision, Commodore. George, I made up my mind a long time ago. God bless you. Cabronis, open up the vents. Surviving officer, the Sculpin, Mr. George E. Brown, who now makes his home in Cincinnati. Mr. Brown, I'm sure our television audience would like to hear anything you might like to say. I can't say how proud I am for the privilege of having served with the men of the Sculpin. Individually and collectively, they were the finest group I've ever known. If this country of ours can produce men like these, we'll have nothing to worry about. No matter what I may do in the future, my days with the crew of the Sculpin will always remain the high point in my life. I know that the country is mighty proud of you and the fighting crew of the USS Sculpin. For his great sacrifice above and beyond the call of duty, Captain John Cromwell was awarded posthumously the nation's highest recognition, Congressional Medal of Honor. His act will stand as a shining example of patriotism for generations of military men to come. Please be with us when the silent service reenacts for you another outstanding submarine story. <laughs> 